Welcome to One Planet Conservation Awareness. And today we're lucky enough to be joined by Sarah, who works at the Pan Veris Project in Sierra Leone. This project is doing some amazing work in a country that not many people have even heard of, doing some pioneering research, finding out what species are in the forgotten jungles of Sierra Leone. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Could you give a brief introduction to yourself and your, your history in conservation? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So um, I am currently a PhD student uh, studying the impacts of the Ebola outbreak on people's uses and perceptions of wildlife, um, which involves a lot of collecting conspiracy theories. But while I was in Sierra Leone looking for a field site to conduct this research, I came across the Otomba Kalini National Park in northern Sierra Leone. And I was really surprised at how difficult it was for me to find any information on this national park. And I kind of quickly realized it was it was quite forgotten as far as national parks go in Sierra Leone and it didn't have a lot of attention. So I decided to create this project called the Pan Veris Project. I decided to create this project to bring uh, people from different backgrounds together to conduct research and to kind of show the government that there is research interest in this area. And along the way, it kind of evolved and we do a lot of community uh, engagement work now. Um, and our focus has really shifted towards trying to help the people who are living alongside this national park to reduce human wildlife conflict and provide alternative sources of income so that people aren't reliant on jobs like illegal logging and illegal gold mining, which are really big threats to wildlife in Sierra Leone. Um, and one thing that makes this national park so cool and obviously i'm pretty biased um is that it sits in this transition zone where it we're kind of mixing um rainforest habitat with savanna habitat so you get this really cool mix of species that you don't find a lot of places else in the world there's actually 16 primate species found in this tiny national park um big game like hippos and elephants and big cats, five species of big cats potentially roaming or wild cats roaming this national park. Wow. And no one really ever thinks of wildlife when they think of Sierra Leone. Um, it's a small country about the size of Ireland or North Carolina, depending on where you're from in the world. And it's mostly known for things like the Ebola outbreak or Leonardo DiCaprio's film Blood Diamond. But it's a lot more than that. It's a beautiful country and that's, you know, recovering from a pretty traumatic past. Well, the, the history of Sierra Leone, I think, ties in and plays a really important role in the wildlife and natural history of the country, also with its history of exportation and exploration. Could you get, give us a bit of an overview of the, the past in Sierra Leone? Yeah, it's crazy because if you've been to a zoo, you've probably met a Sierra Leonean chimpanzee, or at least a chimpanzee whose forefathers were from Sierra Leone. That's because Sierra Leone is relatively close to Europe um, in the grand scheme of the continent of Africa, and it has a really good natural port. So that meant that for hundreds of years, I mean, I've traced wildlife trade back to 400 BC wow. in Sierra Leone. Um, it was just this massive hub of wildlife export, right? Ivory, chimpanzees, skins, everything. I mean, and now like there's only about a hundred elephants left in the country when in the 1700s they were exporting 3000 ivory tusks at a time. That's crazy. But was that um, wildlife coming? from across Western Africa through Sierra Leone, or was it mainly based um, from the country? A lot of it was from Sierra Leone. You know, there in the 1900s, there were a couple of major exporters that were um, exporting chimps out of the country, and they were sending out hundreds a year, like some of them, like 600 chimps a year, infant chimps going to labs, NASA, going to zoos, going to be pets. Um, and unfortunately, when you catch chimpanzees, a lot of times they, they kill the family group to take the infants. So 
some people estimate that for every one chimp that makes it to its final destination in the wildlife trade, 10 had to die. So if you're thinking, okay, they're exporting, one man is exporting 600 chimps a year. How many chimpanzees is he killing to get those 600 chimps a year? And now the country's down to only a few thousand chimpanzees. You know, um, and I think that that's one of the biggest things that we need to think about when we talk about wildlife conservation in Sierra Leone is that now there's kind of this, we look at like local people who hunt and who cut down the forest, maybe these like villains who are, are out um, and ruining this wildlife habitat. But there is no way that Sierra Leonean wildlife could have bounced back from the massive exploitation that happened from foreign influences for hundreds of years. Well, even you know, up until I, the, the 60s and 70s with England's treasure, Sir David Attenborough was one of the first places um, he went to with ZooQuest to try and collect animals from Sierra Leone, I believe. Yeah, and if you're in the UK, you can watch it on BBC iPlayer. Um, and it's just videos of David Attenborough kind of meandering his way through Sierra Leone, showing people pictures of animals, saying, I'll be back through in a couple of weeks, bring them to me. And I think he's got, he says at one point, like someone had obviously told these people ahead of time that we were coming to collect animals because every day we were being brought boxes and cages and handfuls of, of baby animals every single day. And it's kind of a weird juxtaposition to the David Attenborough that we know now to watch this video and see him just kind of like walking around sticking pythons in his pockets and like carrying this little baby chimp that he's going to bring back to the zoo in London. I um, think, but that's I what think we can let him off for all he's done for global conservation since, I would say. Yes, he is definitely making amends. Absolutely. So that's a pretty in-depth look at the history um, of Sierra Leone and its wildlife. And despite all that destruction and exploitation, you've managed to find this beautiful pocket, kind of like a Garden of Eden in Sierra Leone. So could you tell us a little bit more about the national park and why it has such a lack of research so far on the species that inhabit it? A big reason for the lack of wildlife research in Sierra Leone is the fact that the Civil War went from 1991 to about 2001. Um, and that's, that's quite recent. And that just absolutely removed any structure of research that was going on in the country before then. And the National Park uh, where I work, Otamba Kalini National Park, the tourist camp now where I live when I'm there was actually used as a rebel camp. Um, and you can see bullet holes in the old buildings. It was just absolutely a devastating time for anyone who was in the country. And the national parks kind of became refuges for people as well as they were fleeing these um, kind of like roving forces that were coming through Sierra Leone. They were running and hiding in the bush for months, if not years at a time. And so that's largely what you hear from people in this area. That's what they were doing. Um, and so it's, it's hard to have research going on when that's kind of what the environment is. And nothing just, nothing's really been built back up since. Nothing's come back um, from that civil war. And then the Ebola outbreak didn't help bring, want, make people want to come to Sierra Leone either. Yeah, Sierra Leone sounds as though it's had a, a pretty tough time. But it, in recent times, as things have calmed down a little bit, has the wildlife in the national park been able to bounce back? So I imagine when the refugees were in the forest, they were probably surviving um, on eating a lot of the animals. But now things have calmed down and the people have gone back to the cities and urban areas. Has the wildlife bouncing back or is it hard to, hard to tell? I think that... I think that if you would have asked me this two years ago, I would have said yes. Um, but unfortunately, there's been a massive influx in the demand for rosewood mm -hmm. um, to be shipped out. And unfortunately, the National Park was one of the last pockets of this rosewood that was left. And so over the last 18 months, I have seen the population inside the National Park double. Uh, when I first started working there, I wanted to visit every community inside the Otamba section of the park. And we walked there. It took three weeks-ish total. Three four. weeks walking? 
I only did it a week at a time. <laughs> a wow. Week on, four days off, and then um, yeah, to, to be able to reach these communities because there there weren't roads. Now you can get through the entire national park vehicle because of this illegal logging. Um, I ha and there's they're selectively logging. At, at least I, I guess we have to just kind of be mm -hmm. grateful for small mercies and the fact that they're not clear cutting the entire forest. But um, yeah, and it's all for illegal export. It's all for illegal consumption. And it's, um, it's been really devastating to watch. And I think that if the government doesn't kind of step up and do something about that soon, because we as a small organization, when 1500 loggers move into a national park, mm -hmm. um, there's not really that much that we can do about it. But the national the National Protected Areas Authority of Sierra Leone, they actually just hired 500 new park rangers. So I know that they are taking it seriously. Um, and I was grateful that they were willing to listen to me and look at all of my photos when I came back from my most recent field trip. I went, look, look, this isn't gonna last. You're not gonna have this national park in five years if this keeps happening. Um, I think that, and it's, that shows it's, what, why the research you're doing is so important. Um, because without the research of being able to find what's there, then why should the government protect it? Why, if they don't know what's in there? So can you tell us a little bit about how you're conducting your research and what have you been finding? I think we can see behind you an image from one of your, your camera traps. Yeah. Can my little sooty mangoes. Oh, those man. <laughs> can you tell us um, about are... some of the species you've been finding and, and why that might persuade the government to protect the national park a little bit more? Well, I think some of the most exciting things about the national park are things like elephants, forest elephants, and hippopotamus, and you don't really find those in many places in Sierra Leone nowadays. Um, and it's kind of funny. I even walk, I'll, I'll talk to my Sierra Leonean friends and be like, you know, we have elephants. And they're like, no, you're lying. There's not, there's no elephants in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And that's mind blowing to me that, that people in this country are completely unaware of the fact that there are hippos, that there are elephants. Like people think I'm lying. When I'm like, no, 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 look, here's a picture. Like, come visit, we'll go see them. And they're like, are they in a cage? I'm like, no, they're wild. <laughs> um, and I think that, the more that we as a project can kind of bring back these like images, we bring back videos, we do a lot of camera trapping in the forest because I, I would love to do so much more in-depth research, but right now we're just kind of at that, okay, well, what's in the forest stage mm -hmm. of research, um, which you have to tap first before you can get anything else. So we've just been camera trapping like mad throughout the forest is that people haven't put up camera traps ever before that people haven't surveyed for wildlife before and that's really cool and we're not only able to just be like okay like Sierra Leonean government like look at these cool things we know that they're we can be like look here's a video that you can share with people and that gets people excited and we use these camera trap videos for a lot of like education and sensitization. We got a projector, we whack on these videos and everyone loves it. Like they're like, wow, like this is in our country. This is in our forest. And these um, are some big where, flagship species like chimpanzees, the pygmy hippo, elephants, leopards, some big, some big uh, iconic species that they have in their country. Yeah, the people just don't know, like everyone knows about chimpanzees. There's a big push for chimpanzee conservation in early on. And I think if you want to get a Sierra Leone to tune out any conservation message you have at this point, it's to talk to them about chimpanzees. <laughs> they are so inundated with information about chimpanzees. But you bring out a couple of pictures of some really funky looking antelopes and you've got everyone's attention back. You know, I think it's time to not just focus on these things that like we as foreigners find interesting and fascinating and like flagship species, but to to show people that there's this massive array of biodiversity. And like I said, I find that when I talk to Sierra Leoneans about it, everyone loves to see antelope pictures. But when you talk to like Americans about it, like no one wants to see an antelope picture. They're like, oh, a deer. <laughs> These antelopes spe special? What, what species of antelope um, are in the forest to make the locals so excited? 
I just think the fact that they're there and that they've got these big, massive buffalo and like people just don't know. That's the thing is, is if you're outside of the national park, you could very easily assume that there is not a single wild animal left in Sierra Leone. Um, there's like less than 4% of the original forest cover is there. If you go to the, when you're around the cities, everything is just, I mean, you drive from the capital city to the national park and until you get quite close within the national park, you're not, you're barely going to see any trees. Um, the only trees that are left standing are the ones that are kind of useful to people. So you'll get like clusters of mango trees and oil palm uh, around the village. And then it'll just be like flat grassland that's been used as farmland over and over and over again until it's not very good anymore. So this really is the last sort of pocket of wilderness that these species can survive in. Yes. And there's no corridors for them to be able to move to other natural areas um and and that's kind of what's troubling is that they're 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 stuck in this national park and when people move in with this like illegal logging then they kind of flee this national park looking for sanctuary somewhere else and all they find are villages and so we've had a massive influx of human elephant conflict especially mm -hmm. with all of this Ill illegal logging elephants don't like big loud noises and people coming in and taking down their trees. Surprise. Um, and then they ended up in a bunch of people's farms or in sacred community forests, which make people a bit nervous because those are the forests that, that people will use to, to go find traditional medicine and stuff like that. And you don't really want to be wandering around a very small forest with quite a few frantic forest elephants who've been displaced. It's not safe for anyone elephants or people. That is the issue as the habitat shrinks and humans take over and you know the forest areas then the conflict between these animals and the humans is always going to increase. Mm -hmm. So as well as your research you know showing the government um, and the agencies what what is in the forest is there a possibility to to bring tourism because obviously to to stop people doing a certain trade or getting income from the wood you have to offer them alternatives and normally this is through tourism is that something you're working on trying to increase the the efforts of eco tourism in the area or is this quite difficult especially now during covid times i think we've gone back and forth on that a little bit and ultimately there has there is tourism technically you you can go visit the national park um that's all managed by the government all of the money from the tourism goes to the government. The local communities receive zero benefit. None of them are employed by the national park. I take that back. There's one person from the local community who's employed by the national park and he's he's been working there for like, he's, he's quite old, And but I love him to death. He's the most, oh my gosh, his knowledge of the bush is just mind blowing. Um, and he is so fast and, like he just zips through the forest i'm like i can't go that quickly <laughs> um but it's tourism i don't think is the best call especially when you do look at things like covid like imagine if we would put all of our time and effort into trying to build up tourism and then you know something like this happens and i think that that's the danger of economies that are focused on tourism and i actually studied tourism, ecotourism in my master's degree and found that, that that's that's a big issue. It's like creating this dependency. I'm looking more to try to engage people in alternative uh, sources of livelihood that they can either do themselves um, or to con help us conduct research. So kind of like showing that like, okay, we're here, we're doing this work, but we want you involved and you're going to get this benefit, which is money and hopefully we can help you with the information that we find out. We're doing a, a farm monitoring project right now in one of the villages. And so we have a few people from that community who go out every day and they talk to the farmers to see like what's been destroyed on their fields. Um, and so that we're trying to actually find like how much money is wildlife costing people every year? Like how can we put this into hard numbers? Um, and then how can we find out maybe 
can we plant, can we help them plant other things that the animals aren't going to be as interested in? Um, and so for me, that's what's important. And asking the community, I tell them, I'm like, well, what do you want? They don't see any way that tourism can benefit them. I've tried to say, well, maybe we could sell things to tourists, but they're like, no, we get 10 a year. You know, that's not going to do anything for anyone. Um, so they want job skill they want they want training they're like we want access to legal jobs because illegal logging and, and gold mining and, and that kind of stuff it it's there it pays terribly for hard dangerous work um and it's illegal there's a big risk with that so by offering like decently paying alternatives we're basically injecting money into this economy that isn't a cash economy, it's a subsistence farm agriculture economy. So this money kind of gets redistributed quite well. And even the guys that work with us, they're not wholeheartedly committed to conservation for the rest of their lives. And I'm under no illusions of that. But they're taking the skills that they're learning from working with us, working with computers and GPSs, and then that, that income. And they're working right now, they wanna start a computer cafe in northern sierra leone which would be the first of its kind and that's so cool to me that like they want to take what they've learned from this and apply it to something completely different that's beneficial for themselves and the whole community and oh that's the best you know well i think that's a a great example of showing that all around the world these people that you know have to rely on taking from nature whether it's timber or wildlife they're not doing it because they want to, they're doing it because they have to, because there is no yes. other option. There isn't access to legal jobs, as you say. So it's very easy to point the finger at these guys and say, well, you shouldn't be um, taking out the chimpanzees, you shouldn't be taking out the wood. But unless you give them alternatives and opportunities, then they have no choice. Exactly. That's, that's the end of it. Like, you, no one's going to care about conservation if they're hungry. Absolutely. That's so, so how can people listening to this, how can they help your project and help the communities? And is there any way that people can get involved in the project? So um, in the past, we've run um, like online internships where people can help us sort through camera trap images, like the one that's behind me, where you get to see lots of fun monkeys. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do things like that in the future. You can visit the national park. Sierra Leone is a wonderful place to go visit on holiday. And I think just kind of like building up a positive image of Sierra Leone is yeah. so important because it, it has had so many like negative connotations with it that people maybe don't realize, okay, well, I can go there and I can have this like beautiful relaxing beach holiday and then go on this adventure and go hiking in these like jungly mountains or go like walk across a like seasonal floodplain to look for warthogs and you just kind of wouldn't really attribute that with um maybe like a small country in west africa uh and genuinely i believe that they're the friendliest people in the entire world like everyone in sierra leone is so kind and so welcoming and they throw great parties um, so I think if people just kind of like start experiencing Sierra Leone, that's a positive for me. But you can also visit us on panveris.org, P-A-N-V-E-R-U-S.org, and we take donations. And a lot of those just go to helping pay salaries to keep alternative jobs open in Sierra Leone. Like that's where our money goes. It goes to job creation right now. That's our absolute main focus and priority is salaries for Sierra Leoneans um, and the massive impact that that has is really cool to see. So and I do recommend going onto the website because it's awesome you can look in detail of what you guys are doing but also you can actually have a look at some of the images that are coming from the camera traps and see for yourself the different species that the Pan Barris project is finding. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. We can probably talk for hours about the adventures in Sierra Leone. Uh, and if any of you guys listening do want to find out more, then do go onto the website and there's tons of stuff on there about the research and how you can support the project. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining us um, and we'll speak to you soon and good luck with your project. Thank you.